How's it going today, everybody? Eddie Kernan for Rexy Lab. Welcome to the Guitar Murray. Well, this time, the universe shall provide. I was just doing T40 style electronics on an Ibanez SR300, and I was running into a couple little issues, and I was like, man, I wish I had a T40 to compare this thing to. And what should happen? A guy brings in a T40 to have me fix for him. This thing has this boy this thing needs some love dude this right here is after the guy that brought it to me had cleaned it up it still has a lot of issues but it's for the most part entirely original so we're going to go through and i'm going to explain to you what makes the electronics on this bass so special and I'm even going to demo it for you. These crazy PV electronics in here are so unique. I've never seen them on anything but a PV. And they're really cool. I only have one problem with them. I am wearing this particular shirt on purpose today to give you an idea of exactly what I liked and where my head was back in 1985 when I first started playing bass. My very first bass was a PV. It was a PV Fury. It was a lot more pointy than a T40. I thought this thing was freaking hideous. I mean, it just looked like this big, bulbous, rounded off, goofball, country, idiotic, just tank. You know, this thing weighs a freaking ton but i was very young and very close-minded back then the t40 is really cool and it is a classic iconic bass i am not the only one who disliked these things back in the day they were pretty much giving them away and now good luck finding one under a grand the reason that this bass was brought in was because the owner cannot get the action low enough and i've got to be completely honest it's super high i'm gonna have to really do some figuring i already kind of dug into this thing fortunately for me the owner of this base is fully aware that this thing needs a lot of help in fact i broke a string just looking at the doggone thing and this is absolutely no shock because that is a brass nut and there's so much corrosion on there that it's kind of acting like really really rough sandpaper so i'm going to polish the nut for him and that should make a huge difference. In addition to that, we got kind of the same thing going on with the saddles here. The saddles are frozen. The whole thing sucks. Fortunately, he just told me, do what you will with the thing. Make it awesome. Here's a blank check. Don't make me regret it. <laughs> There's nothing I love more than spending other people's money on awesome guitars. So I'm going to take the neck off and then I'll put it aside and I'll show you what these electronics are all about. So if we look at those nut slots, they definitely have some funk in them. And this, on closer inspection, this is not a brass nut. It's got some kind of gold plating on it, but it looks steel. I wonder if it's steel. Let's find out. So there's a magnet on the back of this little light. Nope it's not doing anything will it stick to the frets not really will it stick to that yes it will gross nasty needs to be dealt with that e right there that slot is horrible they're all bad they all need to be dealt with these tuning machines need to come off this thing is actually facing the wrong way which is kind of cute but there's a much bigger issue there's it's much deeper you see that that is where the piece of metal that the micro tilt is supposed to hit and what they had in it was this you see that that looks like a thumb wheel for like an abr or tunematic bridge to me more importantly it doesn't fit you see that it's just like rattling around in there Obviously, the thing was off-center at some point because we've got a pretty deep mark right there. Nothing about that is good. What I'm going to do, just because I want to be thorough, is I am going to take apart this. My 1985 PV Fury, the very first bass I ever owned, 
which also has a micro tilt on the neck. Very, very similar neck. And we'll find out just exactly what they put in there. Maybe it is that goofy little wonky thing. I don't know. Let's find out together. Sure enough, that is not what came inside this thing. I wonder how in the world they ever got it out. It's gonna work out because I figured something out that's really pretty cool. This hole right here is exactly the size of a penny. Old Honest Abe is gonna give us a hand with getting this neck back up to snuff. In order to properly clean this neck, clean this thing up and clean this nut, I need the nut out. In order to do that, what we do is very gently, very gently score. Hey, look at all that funk coming off of there. Ugh. Oh my goodness. This is one of those things that you take your time with. So all I'm doing is trying to just score this finish so that when I pull this thing out, I don't pull all the finish off with it. If I pull a little off, that's okay. The next thing that I'm going to do is instead of using some pliers or vice grips or something heavy duty, I'm going to use these. These are for pulling frets. These are expensive and they're specialty and they're delicate. They are not for pulling metal nuts out. So why would I do that? Well, it's because I want to be reminding myself constantly to take it easy because this is delicate operation. That is freaking in there. This is not gonna work. Whoever put this thing in here did it so super heavy duty industrial that I'm gonna have to resort to a bigger tool, but be very, very careful. So first we'll try these. They're compact, but they, they're tougher. They'll take more of a beating. And there we have it. Oh, this thing is so gross. But you know what? Now that it's out, we are on the way. Well, that's sincerely no good. You know what? It's okay though. I can fix it. That right there should work. And in addition to that right there should work, it'll give a nice little thing to glue that piece back on. These special files for your nut slot, they are expensive, but they are worth it. And now, without further ado, let's get to just exactly what it is that makes these electronics so awesome. The first thing that we notice right away is that these are humbucking pickups, but the way that they're wired is pretty interesting. But before we get to that, let's do a little polarity test and see what we're looking at. So if it's white, it's north, and if it's black, it's south. Okay, so south, north, south, north. I did download the PV owner's manual for the T60 and the T40, and here's the beautiful thing, same electronics. So here we go. It's time to get into the nitty gritty. What we're gonna do is use the meter here to show you exactly what's going on. So what we have here is a three-way switch to pick between these two pickups, which is nothing outlandish or wild. We've got the neck volume, the bridge volume, neck tone, bridge tone. This right here this is really cool. This is a phase switch. This will put these pickups in and out of phase with each other. This only has an effect if both pickups are on. But if both pickups are on and they're out of phase, it'll sound really thin like a jazz bass. If they are in phase, then it'll just be this big thunderous boom. This is one of the secret weapons of the T40 and the T60, but it's far from the only one. In fact, it's not even remotely the most unique thing. So here we are in the neck position. And if I dial this down just a little bit, okay, well, you know what? We go straight to one. And same thing with the bridge. I suspect that these are audio taper pots. 
you can see that they're both sitting there at 5.61 and 5.22. That seems pretty dang weak for a humbucking pickup, even back in the early 80s. That's because they're not in humbucking mode right now. These things have something that's so weird that most people don't even know what this does. Let's take a little bit of a deeper dive. Going back to our neck pickup right here, I've got my neck volume up all the way in full, and our tone knob is all the way up, which means that the capacitor is not doing anything. It's not throwing any highs to ground. As we start dialing in the capacitor, which will take away some of those highs, watch what happens to the meter. Now that's the output of a humbucking pickup. Do the same thing with the bridge. Now in the middle, these two are this plus this divided by four, which gives us 2.73. That's fairly common, pretty respectable. Now, if we want to make it in series, we can kind of come close to that by backing off these tone knobs. Let's back off this first one. We'll back off the second one and check it out. Now we've got this massive output of 13.8. In fact, if I back this off even more, okay, yeah, we got to the point where the audio taper was not happy and it just said no, no more. That's how we get the thing out of parallel. Your, your tone will immediately increase. Once again, exceptionally cool, nothing that's really earth shattering, nothing that's like life altering, that's not uncommon. See, here's the thing is that if we back, like let's say we back off the neck volume just a touch and let's dial in the entire coil of the bridge. Let's back off the neck just a little bit more. Let's back off the bridge a little bit. Okay, I think that yeah, now we've got an output of 24.2. That is a lot. And the thing is, is that you can just fiddle with these knobs and come up with so many crazy different tones. And this is why this thing has been a sleeper hit secret weapon for the longest time. Those who knew from the beginning kind of laughed at the rest of us and picked these things up for a hundred bucks here and there. Well, joke's on us. Now we get to the point where we're going to start digging into this thing. As I stated originally, I believe that these are audio taper pots. I also believe that these right here are linear taper pots. And the reason why is because when I try to dial in or dial out the other coil in the Ibanez base that I'm trying to replicate this with, they moved way faster than these. And the only thing that I can think is linear taper. Let's talk very briefly about the one problem that I have with this otherwise ridiculously awesome, incredibly innovative instrument. What if I want full humbucker and I don't want any of the highs thrown to ground? There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you can do. And that's why what I did was I got stacked concentric pots to where the top knob is your tone and the bottom knob is dialing in and out the other coil because these were audio taper that didn't work so hot so i got some linear taper ones on the way and we should be all good in the hood as the kids say on the street so let's get in here and take off this bridge plate and something about this just it kind of hurt my soul a little bit to see. You see that little Made in USA right there? I am in Louisiana, which is very close to Mississippi. This was made in Meridian, Mississippi. All PV stuff used to be made there. They had 
huge factories and employed a screaming ton of people and then undercover boss. I understand if they figured that maybe taking stuff overseas would be a good way to, you know, keep their profit margin to where Hartley can buy another fucking yacht. But you know what? If you haven't seen the PV episode of Undercover Boss, if you want to still keep liking them, don't watch it. So enough of that. Let's take this uh, bridge plate off. Uh-oh. Well, like that, there's no bridge ground here. Now let's uh, flip this thing over. There's a capacitor on the jack. And you know what? The way that they did this jack, it looks to me as if they put this thing in exceptionally incorrectly. And this capacitor right here, like it's, it's not connected. It's not doing anything that I can see. So yeah, we've got treble bleeds. God, that looks like a little resistor. That doesn't look like a capacitor. The switch, other switch. I wonder if that's some kind of weird shielding paint. Let's, uh, let's find out. Nope, that's just paint. Okay, so that is a 26, so that's 250K. 250K, 250K. Let's see, yeah, that says audio. And these do not say audio, therefore they gotta be linear. So for those who do not understand how it is that you can dial out the highs while you're dialing in the other coil, let me take a minute to show you how a potentiometer works. This is really cool if you don't know. So here's just a standard Fender Strat pickguard. We've got our volume right here. We've got uh, one lug that is just uh, over here to ground. Then we've got our two tones, neck and middle. Now, if we look at this, we can see that we've got a capacitor that comes off of here and then it connects to this one right here in the middle. There's ground, there's all kinds of stuff going on, but we have an empty lug. We've got an empty lug right there. Now, if we look at these tone pots, we do not have an empty lug. What we have is we've got one that's got this, uh, I am assuming capacitor, uh, and then we've got the middle one going to ground. And then we have this one over here, which has the uh, other coil of the pickup. Basically all that a potentiometer is, is a variable resistor. If you want to measure the value of your potentiometer, what you do is you just put your leads on the outside. Now, if I go to 200 K, it'll just give me this one right here because this says that it has a value of 250 K ohms. So I need to go up to the two meg. And yeah, 272, that gives us the value. Now there is a wiper that's on here. And if we hook up one of the leads to the middle and one to the uh, one to one of the other lugs. This lug is doing nothing. And right now we're dialed all the way out. So if I start dialing this thing in, it'll start coming in. You can see that. There we are. Now, if I pop this thing off and I put it on the other side, then what I have to do is I have to turn it the other way. But you know what? We'll get right back there. And that is how these things work. So oftentimes on a tone, you'll just have one of these things that is not hooked up to anything. It's just kind of sitting there off on its own. But if you hook it up to where the middle is your common, which is your ground, which is exactly the way that this is, and it's going directly off of here, and then you put your resistor on one and then your coil on the other, what you're doing is as you are bringing this in, 
you are throwing the highs to ground, but you are also putting in this other coil. So now what I'm going to do is I am going to desolder this and I'm going to spray all these things out with some deoxid so that it's just great. Everybody's happy. And then I'm going to pull this stupid jack out right here. I talked to the client and he has absolutely no idea what in the world is going on with this capacitor. Now, none of the other caps look like this on here. So I'm wondering if somebody put it on that just read somewhere that this was a cool thing to do. But if that capacitor isn't connected to anything, it's not going to do anything. There is one other thing that I wanted to mention too. He had told me that he thought maybe he had shielded this thing. And I was like, no, it's not shielded. And he said, oh, it's not. Okay. Well, I thought I did, but maybe. And I said, no, it's not shielded. I mean, there's some crappy gray paint in there, like kind of splotchy. And he said, oh yeah, the shielding paint. And I was like, well, it's not doing the job. And he was like, oh, well, that's a bummer, man. Because I paid a lot of money for this teeny tiny little thing of shielding paint. If I put this down here, I'm going to pick a particularly thick spot and have the probes really close. Okay, that's a little shielded. Now let's move away just a little bit. Nothing. Nothing. We'll go over here. Nothing. We'll go over here. Nothing. Here. Nothing. Nothing. This is a very common problem. And this is also why people think that shielding paint absolutely sucks. And shielding paint does not absolutely suck. Shielding paint is absolutely amazing. Just a quick little splish splash, that ain't gonna do nothing. It takes three coats to make this happen. You might also notice, I certainly hope you do, all these little kind of silvery things sticking up. These are little pieces of adhesive shielding that I'm going to be hitting with the paint on the part that goes into the cavity. And then when that paint dries and everything, it should make it to where we've got continuity up to here. And that's going to be a really good thing. You can see on this particular pit guard that there's a little bit of shielding right here, but that's it. And you know what? This shielding is fine. I'm going to leave it, but I'm also going to put more shielding on here. And then when the shielding that's on the pit guard makes contact with these tabs, which are going to make contact here, which is going to make contact with the bridge, which the bridge ground most definitely should have been there, then we're going to have something that's just one heck of a lot more quiet. So the client told me he would be overjoyed if I fixed the shielding issue for him. And I told him I'd be delighted. And in fact, I would be delighted just to make sure that this base right here gets to a point where it's as good as it could possibly be. It's obviously had a really, really rough life through no fault of its own, but that's okay because daddy's home. I've triple coated this thing now and it's pretty good. Not only that, but I put in this mystery missing bridge ground. Who knows why it wasn't in there? I have no idea. Probably the same reason there was a capacitor that was soldered to the ground. And you can see that I've just got a little piece of shielding tape right there that's soldered in. I used to do it with a screw, but I find this so much easier. We also put some shielding on the underside of the pit guard. What was here was, eh, it's all right, but it wasn't quite enough. So what are you gonna do, right? Let's do a little testing, shall we? If this works, I should be able to touch these two. It'll go to zero. Now I should be able to touch anywhere that I want that's one of these little foil things or the bridge. Let's try that. We'll go, let's uh, keep it in the camera. Go to that foil thing and the bridge right here. And you can see that we got continuity. It's a lot better than we had before. Let's uh, go over here and just touch the shielding over here and see what happens. Wow. Okay, that's great continuity. 
So uh, then let's touch this right here. That's still pretty good. And yep. She'll, okay, that is good enough for me. Well, these are exciting times we live in because the body is done. Bridge has been completely gone through, rebuilt. All of these screws, like every, every single screw that was on this thing has come off and been clean. All the gunk has been taken out of the threads and they have been lubed with triflow. So we're looking really good. As far as the body goes, we are uh, the Duke of New York. We are a number one. So let's just put this somewhere safe because the neck is a slightly different story. Although it's much better. If you take a look at that nut, like this is the weirdest nut, man. It's uh, it's made of metal. My circuits gleam. All right. It, it, Calm down, Edward. It was such a mess. It was full of burrs and all kinds of horrible crap. I came this close to swapping it out with a graphite nut, but then I was like, nah, what the hell? So I took this out instead and cleaned it up with the Dremel and then uh, kind of just lightly ran over it with the diamond files. And now I'm just gonna take this uh, abrasive cord and just kind of give it a little polish. So all that's left to do now is condition the fretboard, put the neck back on the body, string it up, intonate it, set the action, get everything just perfect, and then actually play this thing for you fine people that have been sitting here waiting for so long to see just what the big deal of this whole T40 thing is. Like, oh, how, how great can it be? Well, you're about to find out because- Ah, uh, yes, indeed, here we are. This thing is done. And man, it is so cool. It is so much fun. One little note to you guys before I start actually hammering away on this thing. The guy prefers flat wounds, so that's what's on it. So it's going to sound a little different than probably most of you would prefer it to be because uh, most people play round wounds. But... I can still show you exactly how this thing plays and it's really cool. So here we go. Um, let's start off with just being in the middle here. So this is gonna give you a really good idea of how this works. And this right here is a trick you can use on like say a jazz bass or any two pickup bass. Right now, everything is wide open. So here's just an open A. Now this is uh, both pickups in parallel out of phase. But if I back off just one of these volumes just a little bit, in fact, I'll do it with the other hand so I can keep on plucking, the volume will increase a, uh, just a little as I turn down one of the volumes. You hear that? That's because they're no longer in parallel. The second they get into parallel, it's the output of this plus the output of this divided by four. So now it's just a little bit more output, but man, you wanna hear something a little more dramatic than that? That would be the phase switch right here. With the Jazz, I've done the swap to make them both in series and in phase. And in phase is a much more dramatic difference. Case in point, let's check it out. Out of phase, in phase. That's a huge boost. Now, this is an important thing to note about the uh, phase switch right here too, is that it has absolutely zero effect unless both pickups are on. Otherwise, it can't be in phase with anything. If, if only this pickup's on, then it cannot be in or out of phase with this pickup and vice versa, just can't do it. Okay, so let's show this tone knob here. So you guys hopefully remember that only one of these coils is going right now on both of them when these are jacked all the way up. So as soon as I start introducing that capacitor to start throwing the highs to ground, I'm going to be introducing the other coil. I'll just give you a, like a little 
example here, I'll just make something up. This is gonna have a much more dramatic effect if we go into the middle. And that's how it works. You really have to sit down with this thing and monkey around with it yourself for a while, sitting here flipping switches and playing with knobs in order to see how it's gonna do whatever it is that you want it to do. But it's extremely versatile. It's super cool. I absolutely love this thing with these giant pickups and just the crazy electronics and all that other stuff. I still really do wish that you could have full humbucker and all the highs, but I'm working on that. So I highly recommend you go out and check one of these things out. Find one through hook or crook, however you can. Despite what 80s venom loving heavy metal Eddie would have said, this thing is really cool. And uh, I was an arrogant little shit when I was a teenager. You know, uh, I wasn't nearly as smart as I wanted to believe. So that's it. Until next time, everybody, this has been Eddie Kernan for Rexy Lab, making the world a better place, one saved 80 sleeper classic at a time.